Last time, I left the narrative in early January 69 AD, as the troops in Germania hailed the figurehead Vitellius as their new emperor. At this time, Galba had been reigning for barely half a year, and the empire had entirely turned against him. The situation for Galba was so bad that the Germanic rebellion was actually the least of his concerns. In all honesty, the Germanic legions are rebelling completely on their own. They didn't have considerable support. It's true that they're a formidable fighting force, so they're not to be ignored. But this isn't a rebellion as frightening as Vindex is, where the wide-reaching support of the Empire was attained before the rebellion was even launched. So at the outset, it was already extremely dangerous. In the worst case scenario, Galba would just have to play things smart and wait out the rebellion, and things would be fine. The troops are restless, and their leader is ineffective. Eventually, it'll all fall apart, especially with no wide-ranging support. Galba simply needs to not make any mistakes. If you ask Otho, however, the move Galba is about to make is the worst one possible. This is the 96 AD Podcast, Episode 11, The Best Character Arc in History. I'll leave you on that cliffhanger for a bit, and in the meantime, we will motivate the cause for Otho's rebellion by talking about Otho's story up to this point in history. Otho, simply put, is more or less a spoiled aristocrat. Otho's early success under Nero comes directly from the success of his family, and we've talked about how important and powerful the royal family was at this time. And it appears that Otho's family always had an in with the emperor, and with the extended royal family. The future emperor's grandfather was a favorite of the first empress, Livia. Otho's father was occasionally thought to be the son of Tiberius, based on how similar they looked, and how much Tiberius liked the boy. Otho's father would also become a favorite of Claudius, because he would inform on rebellions. Otho himself was a similar age to Nero, and presumably through his father's relationship with Claudius, Otho was able to become close to Nero and befriended him. As I covered in previous episodes, Otho would be one of the closest individuals to the young emperor. Otho undoubtedly had a hand in all of Nero's wildest schemes at the start of his rule. It's even said that Otho played a role in helping Nero orchestrate the murder of his own mother, by helping Nero keep the plot a secret. Otho also played a pivotal role in Nero's most peculiar schemes, where Nero married a woman to Otho to effectively reserve her so he could marry her personally later. When Otho wouldn't give her up because he actually started to love her, Nero responded with exiling Otho by appointing him to one of the Spanish provinces as a governor, where he would stay until he tagged on with Galba's rebellion. All in all, he was there for around a decade. And I just can't resist. I have to convey what Suetonius claims was a joke going around Rome about the time of Otho and Nero's falling out. Otho in exile? Yes and no. That is, we do not call it so. And may we ask the reason why they charged him with adultery, but could they prove it? No and yes, it was his wife he dared caress. And as we covered in previous episodes, Otho was obviously ready to revolt at the time of Vindex's revolt. If it's all the same to you though, I'd like to briefly cover what I think was going on with Otho psychologically. Otho was of course born into the richest and most influential sector of the whole world. He was born in close proximity with the royal family, with the emperor. Otho was quite the delinquent child, and presumably Otho felt invincible and that there were no repercussions for his actions. This was more or less true, and in fact, I'd argue that partying and extravagance for the young Otho only brought him more power since he became the best friend of the young and extravagant Nero. Supposedly, Otho received many beatings from his father for how extravagant and wild he was. I wonder if this made Otho lash out even further since Otho was in his early 20s when Nero started his reign, and perhaps he felt that he was entitled to be a part of Nero's debauchery. It's not clear when he died, but when Otho's father did die in the early years of Nero's reign, Otho used his inheritance to purchase himself an even closer connection with Nero by connecting himself with other rich aristocrats. Additionally, Otho's extravagance increased alongside his power and wealth. Otho was more or less single-minded in being a part of Nero's reign, and it's unclear if there was any kind of intimate relationship between the two. If I can be honest, I'm inclined to believe there was, but that's just speculation. Otho was really young, only in his mid-30s at the time of Galba's rebellion, 
and aside from his years in pseudo-exile, Otho had been personally intertwined with the royal family for all of his life. There's no doubt that he longed to return to his position, and no doubt that he felt entitled to be a part of the imperial entourage, and perhaps to be the man on top all along. While away in Spain, and especially during Galva's reign, Otho would make a point to befriend anyone he could. While he governed, he would throw money around to ensure that all parties were happy with him at all times, and he would always throw even more money around to ensure that any interaction he had with important individuals would result in them feeling appreciative or in debt to the young governor. This was a purposeful, deliberate, and intelligent move for Otho to make. Otho had effectively no enemies, which may be surprising since he was so closely connected with Nero. But this work was all no doubt done specifically to get himself back into the imperial administration despite the relationship with Nero. He aimed to position himself as someone who should obviously be included in the post-Nero imperial reshuffle. It should be stated that Otho had heard a prophecy back while he was a governor that he would be emperor one day, so this only indulged his entitlement even further. So here we have an entitled boy who grew up extraordinarily rich and powerful, who had become detached from power for nearly a decade, and he sees an opportunity to return to power with Galba, and expects a role in the new government. Maybe he's secretly expecting to become the emperor himself one day. He does everything in his power to plant the idea of his rule in everyone's mind, and distances himself from every mistake that Galba makes. By the time January 69 AD comes around, Otho expects nothing less than to be formally adopted by the childless Galba to be the next emperor of Rome. There's a good amount of people who would like this decision, but more importantly, there are very powerful individuals with swords who would hate it if this decision was not reached. Of course, Galba was aware of Otho and his desires, so Otho was not forgotten, but he will be specifically ignored. The decision to choose an heir must have been tough for Galba, since he waited to the very last moment to choose. Galba was in his mid-70s, so everyone feared the sudden death of the emperor, and the civil war that would inevitably follow. So it was relatively reckless to push this back so far. But I can appreciate Galba wanting to first consolidate power within himself first, before choosing someone to share it with. Galba would end up waiting until Vitellius' revolt to actually appoint an heir. This is somewhat a good idea, since Galba was able to choose an heir in response to the grievances from the provinces, instead of trying to preemptively choose the right person. However, he, he chose the wrong person regardless. Or maybe the revolt was unstoppable, who's to say? The result, however, was that everyone felt that the decision was pushed back far too long, which was needlessly dangerous, and then the wrong heir was chosen on top of that. Everybody had their own guy that they thought should be the best heir, and it seems that nobody was satisfied with the choice of Piso. The one who hated it most, of course, was Otho himself, who thought that he should be the heir to the emperorship. Of course, Otho was in a considerably more powerful position than most other influential figures. Otho was in the city, and he was always hanging out with the imperial administration. Like I discussed earlier, Otho also devoted most of his time to getting everyone indebted to him. In fact, it came to a point that Otho had been throwing around so much money that he spent much more than he actually had. He had taken out an incredible amount of loans, no doubt promising the loaners that once he became emperor, they'd be adequately reimbursed. The problem now for Otho was that he was in an extreme amount of debt, and it seems that there's no way he can pay it off, because he's not going to be the next emperor. It was therefore a mix of Otho's ambition, entitlement, and finally the crippling debt that made him have to try and become the emperor. Otho himself said that he's equally likely to die to an enemy in battle as to his creditors in the forum. He was running out of time and he needed to find some way to make the money, and becoming the emperor is the best scheme possible. Otho shelled out the last cash to his name to several members of the Praetorians, the royal bodyguard, and waited for the right day to strike. The date is the 15th of January, a peaceful Sunday. Servius Sulpicius Galba the 73-year-old emperor of the Roman Empire was making a sacrifice in front of the Temple of Apollo. Alongside him was his good friend, Marcus Salvius Otho. The Harospex, the man who interpreted the omens, informed the duo that the omens told a bad story on this particular day. He explained to the emperor and his dear friend that the omens foretold treachery and disaster. No doubt Galba was disturbed by this. Meanwhile, Otho felt that this sign proved that his schemes would be successful, 
and that today was finally the day. Not long afterwards, one of Otho's freedmen came up to the duo and told Otho that the architects were ready. This was the predetermined signal that the troops were organized. Otho excused himself from the emperor's presence, saying that he's being shown some new houses to buy. The freedman directed Otho to a carriage that was organized to take him to the Praetorian camp. The carriage marched Otho over towards his base of operations, but the restless usurper felt that the carriage simply wasn't moving fast enough, so he hopped out and started running. Otho paused his run to tie his shoes, and it was at this moment that the civilian crowds, at the suggestion of his Praetorians, surrounded Otho and spontaneously hailed him emperor. The young now emperor had only a couple dozen soldiers to his name, but as he continued his march towards the Praetorian camp, any and every soldier that he came across joined up with him. Quite quickly, Otho was able to get the entire Praetorian guard under his control. Otho declared that he would only take the powers that they granted him, and would not ask for any more. How kind and humble of him to do. This all is, of course, a story that Otho wanted to present. That he was spontaneously hailed emperor by the crowd, and there's no way he could turn it down. It's far more likely that Otho simply ran over to the Praetorian camp and rallied their support. With the Praetorians, he'd have the overwhelming majority of military power in the city, and that's all you need. Regardless, this all happened so quickly, whatever happened, that the now former emperor was still making a sacrifice at the Temple of Apollo. A rumor first reached the emperor that some senator was being hailed emperor, and then eventually it was confirmed to be Otho. Galba got completely overwhelmed by messengers from all over the city. Some told him that he had nothing to worry about, while some others told him that there was nothing he could do to stop the rebellion. Galba and Piso immediately gathered what soldiers they had, and it was decided that Piso should go to the Praetorian camp to perhaps win them back. It was at this time, then, that Otho's supporters in the growing crowd around the Emperor's soldiers, managed to spread the rumor that Otho had been killed, with many soldiers claiming that they saw Otho get killed themselves. The lack of credible information led Galba to go entirely on the offensive. He was mounted in a carriage, and his troops marched out to find the conspirators. While on the march, a soldier approached the Emperor and told him that he had killed Otho himself. The only response that Galba had for him was, Who gave you that order? A perfect summation of Galba's reign and disposition. In fact, Otho was not dead. Uh, he was just addressing a large crowd on the other side of the city, with more and more soldiers flocking to his banner every second. A dispatchment of troops was sent by Otho to kill Galba and Piso, and they had to hurry too. Galba and his troops were arming the civilians in the forum, and who knows how large this conflict could get if both sides were allowed to gather as many soldiers as they could. Galba was very obviously sending messengers all around the empire asking for support. Otho needed to settle it today. The massive dispatchment of Othonian cavalry bursted into the forum at full speed and immediately overtook the small force under Galba. Galba was pretty old and sick. He could barely move, and it was easy for the troops to identify the imperial litter, eject the emperor, and kill him on the floor of the forum. Galba's administration had entirely collapsed, with his advisors turning on each other, resulting in Galba's primary administrator being caught in the slaughter, in addition to the emperor and his heir. The other two main administrators of Galba would later be caught, one assassinated and one executed. The whole of Galba's administration had been ousted in not even a day, and it was entirely replaced by the young and assertive Otho. The Senate met, declared Otho the next Augustus, and gave him every imperial honor and power. The body of Galba was left in the forum for quite a while. It was there until one of his slaves found it later in the day, and gave it a humble burial. Tacitus sums up the life of Galba thus, Such was the end of Servius Galba, who in his 73 years had lived prosperously through the reigns of five emperors, and had been more fortunate under the rule of others than he was in his own. He seemed greater than a subject, while he was yet in a subject's rank, and by common consent would have been pronounced equal to empire had he never been emperor. With Otho we see the start of the flip-flopping of extreme emperors. We had ousted Nero, and got a wholly opposite Galba, who was then ousted by his wholly opposite Otho. Otho was clearly seen as kind of a return to Nero, for better or worse. Some say that he added Nero to his name, 
and his first act as emperor was to order the completion of Nero's absolutely over-the-top, extravagant, and needless golden palace that was, by the way, built over the land that burned in the Great Fire in 64, the fire that he's accused of starting. Quite suspicious that he decided to build a palace there, but regardless, Otho decided to finish it. It seems that Otho entirely devoted himself to his empire, working tirelessly and avoiding abusing the advantages of being emperor. It seems that he did everything right. After the initial slaughter of the top half dozen or so members of Galva's court, Otho is very restrained in his punishment. Exile and appointments to provinces were taken instead of outright executions, and the senate, the people, and the army were overjoyed for this. The new emperor was settling in nicely, and everyone was happy with the start of his new reign. It would come then as a huge disappointment that the Ryan legions, who revolted against Galba, decided to continue the revolt even though Galba was gone. Apparently, they didn't really care specifically about Galba, they just wanted fame and money. Who would have guessed? Many letters with deals and overtures were sent between Otho and Vitellius, but it's clear that the inertia of the soldiers couldn't be stopped, and the two men were powerless against it. At this point, they aren't even revolting for any reasonable purpose, they're just revolting for revolting's sake. Spies were sent out by both administrations, delegations and envoys were sent by both administrations all over the empire, but no settlements could be made, and civil war was inevitable. Otho got the support of the Balkan legions, the Spanish legions, Southwest Gaul, Mysianus in Syria, Vespasian in Judea, Alexander in Egypt. Otho had overall strength, with most of the empire in support of him. But, in fact, he had few soldiers ready to fight in Italy. All his support came from the far ends of the empire. He didn't have enough soldiers to fight against the Germanic legions, at least not right now. Vitellius had some of the best legions in the empire and was able to quickly march to Italy, so he did. He didn't have time on his side. A swift victory is needed for him to even have a chance, since at any point his rebellion could just fall apart. Otho made a blunder then in hoping to win a quick victory against Vitellius. It's true, a quick victory at the outset of the war could demoralize the troops enough to make the rebellion fall apart, and that does most of your work for you. But Otho could have bided his time, let the rebellion fall apart on its own. After all, it had effectively no support. As a quick detour, I want to talk about the consuls. New consuls were brought into office on the 1st of January, and at this point, they were almost always appointed by the emperor. So, two pro-Galba consuls were in place for 15 days before Galba was overthrown. They were of course removed by Otho, and Otho made himself and his brother consuls until March. It is on March 1st that Lucius Virginius Rufus comes back into the story. He's made consul for two months alongside one of his old friends. This was a gesture towards the Germanic legions, since they loved Rufus over everyone else. That's the main purpose of the consulship at this point in history, is to appease certain factions and individuals. I love Lucius Virginius Rufus, and I'm so happy that he came back into the story for the second last time. We'll see him again in 30 years. Otho spent a few months of his reign doing the best job he could. He pardoned many, and he granted citizenship to many more. He tried to win over everyone in the empire, without the excesses of Nero. If it all didn't fall apart, we could be talking about the start of the amazing reign of Otho, the rival to Augustus. He was only in his mid-thirties after all, he could have reigned for like 40 years, and any emperor who reigns for that long is bound to be liked. Unfortunately for him though, the Balkan legions were slowed because of an invasion of foreign tribes. Just because the Romans are caught up in a civil war does not mean that everyone else stands still, of course. They would eventually get a large victory, and it would boost the military credibility of Otho's rule, but in March, Otho had to head north with his army to face Vitellius. A naval battle on the west coast of Italy resulted in an Othonian victory, and in total three minor engagements were won by Otho's army. A good start, but Vitellius' troops were not knocked out of the war. They were not yet demoralized. They still thought they could win. Otho had the upper hand for sure, since the German armies were slowly pouring down over the Alps, and Vitellius himself had not yet arrived. It was just one of his legates calling the shots. This legate, Valence, was extremely capable and talented, actually, and in another universe could have become emperor himself, if he had the right social status. 
Regardless, the Athonian armies, it seems despite victories, morale was relatively low. The soldiers loved their emperor and had total faith in him, but despised their other commanders. They had no faith in them, and genuinely, they just hated them. There are always spies and deserters in civil wars, so Vitellius was able to learn of this and decided to abuse the weakness. After all, Otho couldn't be everywhere at once, and usually he wasn't leading the armies himself. Eventually, a large contingent of both armies met, and in fact, neither Vitellius or Otho was at the site of the battle. The Vitellians outnumbered the Othonians, and they were also more steady and disciplined. One of Otho's newbie legions, at the center of the Othonian line, was almost instantly destroyed, and the command of the Othonian army fled at sight. Classic cowardly commanders. With the center of the Othonian line crumpled, the Vitellians were able to cut right through the middle of the army, and the Othonians turned and fled in a disastrous rout in all directions. Otho was back in the camp and heard the news of the battle. His immediate army was destroyed, and all was lost. His troops didn't immediately overthrow him, which is absolutely shocking. In nearly every other situation like this in the history of Rome, the commander with the losing army gets killed by his men so that they don't get killed by the soon-to-be new emperor. But in this case, they stuck by him. It wasn't Otho's fault that they lost the battle. He wasn't even there, so fair enough. They still believed in their emperor. And a disastrous battle was simply proof that those other commanders all sucked, as they already knew. But the point still stands. There's no way Otho can protect them, so why stand by him? It's just because they liked him that much. Otho had reserves. He had reinforcements on the way. The Balkan legions were ready to come over the Alps and hit the Vitellians in the rear. Otho still had a decent chance to win the war. It was only the battle that was lost. Otho, however, decided against this. We have extremely credible evidence that Otho genuinely hated the idea of having a civil war, and that he would do anything to avoid it. He wanted to see the suffering stop. According to Suetonius, a historian writing in the 130s AD, Suetonius' own father was there and confirmed all of this. Suetonius tells us that Otho was completely driven off the edge when a fleeing soldier from the battlefield appeared at the emperor's feet. He was the first person to bring news of the defeat. He declared that the battle had been a disaster and that all was lost. The soldiers near the emperor called him a liar and they called him a coward for leaving if that's the case. The soldier then committed suicide then and there. Otho was not only convinced, but he was so moved by this that he decided not to risk any more of his soldiers' lives. After all, if this soldier was able to commit suicide for the failure in the battle, why should his emperor do anything different? Otho's troops told him that he had nothing to worry. They begged for him to be optimistic. They made it clear that the troops would fight to the bitter end, no matter what that end was. Otho snapped back at them. He told them that if they wanted to help, they should go to the battlefield and resurrect their fallen comrades. The troops continued to beg their emperor not to give up the fight, not to desert his loyal army. But some of the officers understood the state of affairs. The German legions had full control of the region, and any counteroffensive would be not only extremely challenging, but extremely costly. The outcome was not certain, and it could take months to years to resolve, and would take up the entire fighting force of the Empire. Who knows what disasters could befall on us? If we spend a year with the Balkan legions out of the Balkans, who know what invasions might ensue? And ignore the fact that we'd be having the Balkan legions and the Rhine legions, the best legions in the Empire, tearing each other apart. These officers appreciated the Emperor's stance to end the war here and now by any means necessary. But the ordinary soldiers didn't see the big picture. They wanted to fight for their empire. They wanted to fight for their Emperor. Otho opposed more war entirely. And Tacitus, writing in the 1st century AD, claims that Otho said the following to one of the overzealous soldiers. I hold that to expose such a spirit, such a courage as yours, to any further risk is to put too high a value on my life. By this let posterity judge Otho. I need neither revenge nor consolation. Others may have held the throne for a longer time, but no one can have left it with such a fortitude. 
Let this thought go with me, that you are willing to die for me. But live, and let us no longer delay, lest I interfere with your safety, or you with my firmness. Take as the strongest proof of my determination the fact that I complain of no one. With this, Otho had all the soldiers leave him. Otho said an emotional goodbye to his brother, his nephew, and to his closest friends. He then commanded them to leave and seek out safety above all else. He made sure that everyone was sent away and would be sent away in finely furnished boats and carriages. He destroyed all letters between himself and his allies, ensuring that as few people as possible could be caught up in a Vitellian purge. As far as Vitellius was concerned, no one but Otho took part in the conspiracy. Otho decreed that deserters should not be punished, and that they should be allowed to leave peacefully. He then talked to his young nephew, who was very anxious and very emotional about what Otho was saying. Otho explained to the boy that ending it now would mean that his supporters would get off easier, and so that his family and his troops could survive. At the very least, if he killed himself now, they'd all have another day to live. He then told him, I have obtained enough reputation for myself, enough nobility for my family. Successors to the Julii, the Claudii, the Servii have been the first to bring the imperial dignity into a new family. Enter then on life with a brave heart, and never entirely forget or remember too vividly that Otho was your uncle. After he was sure that all his friends had safely departed, he spent a few hours alone in his bedchamber. Otho woke up at dawn and immediately stabbed himself. His attendants would then bury him at once as he requested. The soldiers were inconsolable, with several of them apparently committing suicide themselves upon hearing the news, out of respect for their emperor, not fear of Vitellius. Otho's troops felt such a connection to him and were entirely devoted to his reign, and the matter of his dignified death only martyred him in a way to his troops, almost making him like a god to them, more than Roman emperors would normally become gods. His death had such an impact in part because it contrasted entirely with the rest of his life. This is what makes Otho so interesting. The fact that he consciously chose to prematurely end his life, in part to secure a good legacy for himself, and it completely worked. Of course, he also aimed to end the Civil War, and that did work until another one started a few months later, but that's not his fault. For better or worse, the Emperor who reigned for only 95 days, in the complete opposite manner to Galba, was largely unliked until he became emperor, and especially once he died. On that last night, Otho spent several hours on his own in his personal bedchamber, thinking and preparing to end his life. I can't imagine what that's like, and I don't really want to, but we can kind of get in his head a bit, because the only thing he did before falling asleep and after dismissing his troops was write two letters. One letter was to the woman he wanted to marry, Nero's widow, asking her to bury him and preserve his memory. The last letter, the last thing that Otho wrote, and the last words that he said, was to his sister, an apology for all that has happened.